The Simon Goodwin has been good enough to do it. Welcome, Goody. Yeah, morning, Gaz. Morning, Bucks. Good to be on. Timing's everything. Yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal, Gaz. <laughs> he kept saying, when are you coming in? When are you coming in? I thought, wait till we got our first loss and then jump on. Let's get to the serious stuff straight off the top. What is that you're drinking right there? I'm drinking a bit of Ed Langdon's Lay Day Coffee. So Ed and Tom started a business where they see a, a market for premium instant coffee. And, uh, Lay Day. Lay Day. So he's... Uh, and Tom's in that as well, I think. Yeah, Tom's so, in yeah, that. So, yeah, so yeah, the, the Langdon brothers are... family just going to the... Um, what, is it instant? Is it cappuccino style? What are we talking Yeah, it's instant black coffee. Really? So, uh, yeah, no, they've come together and, and put it together. Ed still hasn't given me a free <laughs> tub of it yet, so uh, hopefully this plug will get is it. He had the week off. Is he going to be back? Yeah, no, he'll be back. So we'll get uh, four guys back this week, which will be great. So Tommy MacDonald, Christian Salem, James Harms, and Ed Langdon all come sure. back. So I met, we mentioned that. Before you came in, just about system versus personnel and, and, and buffering, the inevitable loss of players as you go along. So was, was there a tipping point for you on the weekend, you believe? I think when you head into a game, you can plan for certain scenarios before the game if you know you haven't got certain personnel. But when it happens mm. in-game, that's when it's a bit more challenging for you as a, as a coaching group. And um, obviously losing Stephen May early in the game. Um, normally we'd have Tom McDonald, who we actually lost on the Friday heading into the game, that would go back for us. So... Um, we had to readjust. We're a little bit light mm. on for tools down back, and you know, to Fremantle's credit, you know their system is very strong, and mm. um, you know to break down system, you've got to win a lot of contests, whether it be air or ground, and um, you know we weren't able to do that on the weekend. And and we, with the aerial contests, like contested marking, we were just talking before we came on. So you you were beaten fifteen to four contested marks. Now that part of the game is that something that you look at a lot as a coaching group because obviously you are strong both behind and in front of the ball generally with the aerial. Yeah, something that we, we need to be strong at as a, as a group and a club to, to win finals footy. And it's something that we, we spend a lot of time on, both our, our contest level in the air and at the ground. It helps you, you win ground position and, and helps you, you dominate games where, where you need to dominate them. So you come off a premiership, which, yeah, the, the emotion and everything else. And then the next year is always, how does that affect hunger? How does it affect yeah, all those different intangibles? So to win 10 on the trot, you'd... Big, big tick, you know, and not always in your best, at your best, but you've got the wins. Were you of the? Were you sitting there going, "Oh, we're going to lose one at some stage"? I know you don't want to lose one, obviously, but the history says that you will. Um, were you hope, not hoping, but did you think it would come now, later? Where'd where'd you sit with all that? I think it's just the reality of footy. You are going to lose. You know, I think no team's gone through any season undefeated at any stage in in the history of the game. So it's going to happen. It's more. Um, you know, you don't want to lose, but you get another set of information. It reaffirms what's important to you, what you need to be good at, um, and it gives your players a different look at look at the game. And us as a club, how we handle losing is, is different how you handle winning. So now the template will be there. This is how you beat Melbourne. You think there's enough in that for other clubs now to be able to throw sim- – uh, there's one thing saying it, there's another thing actually doing it, of course. Yeah, look, we've had those challenges for the last 18 months, you know, where teams have thrown different stuff at us and – you know, try to break us down in various areas. Um, what we do as a group and a playing group and a coaching group is we learn from those scenarios. And as I said, there's, there's areas of the game that reinforce us on the weekend what we need to be strong at. And if you're prepared to give up territory clearance like we did on the weekend and you can't win enough contests both at air and ground, you're going to suffer the consequences against good teams. And, and that was a, a really clear thing for us on the weekend. Good. It seems to me that there's a couple of coaches that come in. I think Sam Mitchell and, and Craig McRae is too. Now they've coached, well, Craig McRae's coached for a long time, but they just seem to be a lot calmer and more even emotionally than, than, I, I, than I reckon I was when I first came in and felt the sort of the ebbs and flows a little bit. How would you describe, I suppose, your evolution as a coach and, and how much more comfortable are you now in your role and your capacity to um, you know, present in the environment um, that you've created at Melbourne? Yeah, look, I think I've had to learn. There's no question about mm. that. You know, when I first came in, I was very intense, um, wanted to do everything myself and, and didn't probably delegate to the other areas of the, the staff that was needed. Um, and it's really was about trying to establish the things that you wanted in your environment. And that's, that's really challenging for a young coach coming in. But I think as you grow into the role, you understand the importance of everyone's role within the footy club. And you also understand that the, the game, that there will be realities. You will lose. You will have times in the season where you're not playing your best footy. Um, but if you keep the bigger picture in mind and the reality, and I think our playing group and our players do it for us these days as well, they like a relaxed environment. Mm. They like a nice, comfortable environment to work in. And, and as a coach, you're trying to you know, give them the best environment possible. Well, uh, Gary was saying that he saw Vossi getting a coffee 
about three hours before or three and a half hours before the game and sort of thinking, geez, he's going to cut it fine to get there. Do, well, you, thought, have, do you have anything in particular? What I was particular about to pre- say <laughs> is you've lived in Brisbane for most of your life or Adelaide. You don't know this <laughs> <The> traffic. <laughs> as, as a coach, that is the best time of the week. You know, the, the probably the, the day before the game, the last, you know, the, the night before the game and also the morning of, it's the best time to be relaxed. To, it's the to only just get your Yeah, it's the only respite from the job because you know once you hit the game and after the game, that's your time that you really And what in. do you do? What what were you doing that time? I do some exercise, relax, go out for breakfast, go out for dinner, have a glass of wine, those sorts of things, just to relax and get yourself in tune for the reality of life, spend some time with the kids. Yeah. Um, Great work. You can't come on radio and make a mistake when it comes to Collingwood, who went through the home and away season undefeated in 1929, Goody. She's... I made, it, I made a blue there, haven't I? <laughs> you were out, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think it was an 18-game season, though. Oh, no, fair enough. Um, so? <laughs> <laughs> what about... Um, how do you have a... You know, Melbourne supporters will be sitting there going, explain this to me. You've got the best midfield combination in, in the game, arguably. You always say arguably. You're getting out. Max Gorn, Clayton Oliver, Christian Petrarca. And I know Petrarca was cooked, so he wasn't in there as much. Viney. And you lose centre bounce nine one in the third quarter. So when you're sitting in the bottle, you're sitting down on the ground. And you're going, what what's going on? Can you explain that or not? Yeah, look, we discussed a lot throughout that quarter about how we get some of that momentum back in the centre bounce, and it was about execution of role. You know, it doesn't matter sometimes what talent you've got. You know, Fremantle got enormous talent in there as well. You know, they're a good footy team. They've got two good rucks. Um, they've got some quality on bowlers. So, um, you know, execution of role wasn't quite to the level and. And, you know, we got our hands on the ball four times in that first seven, seven bounces. So mm. it wasn't necessarily a structural system. We just didn't have great ball security and execute. So is that part of it? Like we talk with we, we, we system and personnel. Like you still got to just do the basics of the game well. So what I see is that Melbourne in the last 18 months in particular have been the team that have done the basics of the game the best. How much work do you do on it? And... And, and how do you maintain that consistency to be able to do it, you know, over that period of time? Yeah, we spend a lot of time on role and um, execution of role and um, under pressure. And, and every game this season, we've had to reset ourselves in game. Teams have come at us at various stages throughout the game, and that's footy. Momentum shifts. Mm. And we've been able to get back to the things that drive our game consistently on the back of just role execution. And um, on the weekend, that was the thing that suffered the most. You know, we weren't able to... Uh, to stop that momentum, and we did, didn't get back to what we needed. It was really important to Got us. Got Simon Goodwin until 10 to 8. So you can fire in your questions, and there's plenty coming off the old temper text machine, some of them very pointy-ended. Yes, what are you looking at? You're not going to ask it now, are you? No, what? Another question. I was just getting to the, the news headlines. That's oh, what I was go saying. Go for it then. <laughs> he's, he's, he's with us. I'm still. in it. I'm in this. I know. I can see. You don't take any attention to the clock. Is it, now, I'm telling you, it's a hard, this is a hard uh, audience. Jackson's progress is stalled. Petrarca hasn't taken a single contested mark all year. Plus, he can't kick for goal. That's just a statement he's put out H. there. H. Yeah, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough industry. Um, you know, those guys are progressing. You know, Luke Jackson's, a, you know, a third year player that's a, a key position player. And his development in the last 18 months has been enormous. You know, he hasn't stalled. Um, he's continuing to improve his game and, now, he's going to have weeks where he's still inconsistent. He's a young player and he's still still evolving his game. So, um, you know, he's got some really exciting things ahead of him. And the obvious follow-up before I hand over to Nathan is um, the contractual status of both he and um, Angus Brayshaw has come through about 30 times. So I'll get that out of the way for you. Yeah, look, both progressing well. You know, we expect something to be done in the not-too-distant future. Um, obviously, we respect the players and their decisions, but you know, we've got two guys there that love their footy club. You know, Angus is a leader. He's invested so much. He came to our footy club in 2014, right at the start of really starting to build something, and um, he's so invested in our club, and I'm sure he'll be there for a long time. It, it, just on Jackson, the, could you understand the, if someone put the big godfather offer to him from back home, and would you begrudge him that? Oh, that's our industry. You know, it's... Um, you know, if you put all your players on the open market, they're going to get more money going somewhere else. Um, but then you have got to evaluate as a player what you want in your career and where you want to be and who you want to play with and what you want to be involved in. And, um, you know, we've created an environment where those two players love what they're at and they're developing and, you know, we want them there for a long time. So you think when you have success, you know, even those comments off the off the text, you, you sort of the expectation is it's going to be a linear, you know, upward curve. Um, and that has that doesn't happen either as a as a player or as a team. In the, in that last sort of eighteen months, what was there one performance that really established your confidence in the group or the or the group's confidence in itself in that time? 
Yeah, I think in the, at the start of last season, we had a great summer heading into the start of last season. And, um, you know, we'd won the first five games and mm. we started to execute role consistently over a period of time. And we started to develop a brand that was looked quite sustainable. And then we played Richmond in the Anzac Eve game. And um, it was at that point um, on the back of that game and that result and the way we played that I thought, yeah, we've got some, some genuine ability to do some damage here if we continue just to do what we need, you know, we can do, you know, we've got some strengths, we've got some weapons and we've got a game style that can stand up when it counts. And you're, you're sur- like, and obviously as the year developed, you, you surge football and you just, your capacity to be, I mean, you, your finals performances were as damaging a, a brand of footy as we've seen. And it's often people look at, you know, scoring as being, well, have, have, look how heavily they scored. But I mean, at the moment you're the second best D and you're about you're about seventh or eighth in offense. When you think about your best football, what are the elements that you're actually seeing that you're doing well when you're playing your best? Uh, but when we play our best, we win contest yep. and we we defend incredibly well. And what that does so is that the so it's that's one, that's two, and then the offense comes off the back of that as is the third phase. Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah, you need to play well in all three phases to be a challenge, and you need to be able to win multiple ways. To, to, to win it right at the end because you're going to be challenged in those areas of the game. But the core fundamentals of our game, we want to be strong defen- uh, contest-wise and then really strong defensively. And we know if we do that, we'll eventually wear teams down as the game goes on because it is a four-quarter game and you, you get the opportunity to, to lock into a contest and wear them down. Yeah, uh, Three coaches, the toughest ones. Though. They're all tough. I know that. Uh, that's the Dorothy Dixer answer, but... Yeah, I think the ones that are more experienced are always the tougher ones because they can sense momentum and, and pull the right lever in game. So Alistair Clarkson's always been one. Chris Scott's another one that clearly, you know, is very hard mm-hmm. to coach against. And then uh, Bucks, my record against Bucks is horrendous. So uh, oh, obviously experience in uh, in have coaching a look, and have a look at him now. understanding. Just when you have a bit of paper and just push it under the nose of someone. <laughs> <laughs> just had a crack Dave's on the road. He's got a question for you that I must say it's the area where I think the improvement can come from, but I'll let Dave fire it at you. G'day, Dave. Morning, Gary. How are you, buddy? Good. You're talking to the coach of Melbourne. Morning, Simon. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks, Dave. Uh, just a quick question, mate, about entry into the forward line this year. It seems at times our key forwards are all challenging for the same ball. Um, we seem to be trying to outmark one another at times. Is that a concern, or how do we combat that? Yeah, look, it's something we're, we've been working on for, for a couple of years and, you know, we've made some huge progressions in that in the last, you know, 18 to, to 24 months. And, um, you know, our tool spent a lot of time on their separation and working in cohesive nature for the centre, but it's it's a combination of all the things that are up the field as well, our ability to move the ball in certain areas of the ground to, to give them really good looks. But, uh, you know, it's something we always look at, we always work on and, and make sure that's 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 a real finishing touches in the game. And I think at the back end of last season, you saw that on the back of contest and defence, we started to connect and, and really hit the scoreboard, and that's something we'll continue to look at. It does look like you're happy to go there, though. Like you're happy to go long and just get that contest in the air. Yeah, we are. You know, we, we're, we're keen to put, put defences under pressure and, and get our forwards really jumping at the footy and um, getting good looks at it. So, you know, we've got some tall targets down there with, you know, Benny Brown, Tom, Tom McDonald, Sam Wiedemann, Luke Jackson, Gaunt Gorney at times. So give them as much look as we can. So you were one of the first that really sent you, you know, Ruckman, just go go for it. We want you to be aerial players in front of the ball. So put the um, defences to the sword. That, that's that been a, a positive part of the last 18 months. Yeah, look, obviously when you've got Max, who's got an enormous tank, yeah. um, to be able to, to both work, operate behind the ball and in front of the ball, and we'll manipulate that depending on what the game needs at various stages. But, um, you know, the athletic nature of Max and Luke give us that opportunity to do that. Changing gears a little, like there's there's been a lot of focus on umpires and, you know, the dissent rule has brought that up and you know, we get a lot of, you know, comments that come through, callers that want to know about it and, and um, focus on it. How do you see that the, the, the umpire's role in the game and the relationship that you have as, as a club with the, umpiring, uh, the umpires and the umpiring department at the moment? Yeah, look, clearly... Um you know, heading into the season, it was pretty clear agenda from everyone at AFL that um, we needed to build more respect for our umpires and we needed to build a pathway both at community level and at AFL level to get more people invested mm-hmm. in umpiring and, and make it a genuine pathway. And I think, you know, our connection with the umpires has been terrific. They come out to our training as much as they can. They support us wherever we need them um, within our training, with our, within our preparation. And um, I think the players have done an amazing job in the first 10 weeks of building that respect on field. 
um, you know, with the descent rule. And it hasn't been perfect by any stretch of the mm. imagination, but you can see the behavioural change that's starting to take place. But I think we all play a role in, in getting this done as, a, as an industry. And that's not only the players, it's the coaches, but it's also the media. Mm. You know, I think in the last couple of weeks, I think it's been a little bit unfair. It's been a, a pretty big pile-on in terms of the umpiring um, you know, decision criticism, making, criticism and, yeah. and I understand um, where they're coming from, but at the same time, I think uh, we all play a role to build this pathway as a genuine career and it doesn't mean they don't have any accountability. I'm sure internally there's lots of accountability to their decision making, but um, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways we're making some progression there as well. So the pot, then you'd say the pile on from, and we're not, we're not, well, we can be precious, don't worry about the media, but you're sort of specifically talking from a media point of view. I just think we all play a role in, in building this. And I think if we're getting to a point where we're asking our players and everyone within yep. our industry to do it, yep. you know, the last thing we need in the last few weeks is the complete pile on that we've seen about umpiring and, you know, the system and mm -hmm. where it's all going. Um, you know, they're under immense pressure. You know, they play an important role in our game and without them, yeah. uh, the game looks completely different. Well, I've got to say, like, looking out on the oval, watching the game, there's actually, there's these four boundaries and three, like there's a lot of umpires. Like, so, and, and it's, I think it's right because the, to get the right position to make the right calls and you've got a big um, system behind that are trying to coach these guys around being as good as we possibly can. So there's a lot of um, a lot of focus going on it and I think we're seeing real improvement. Kaz from Essendon has called in with a question that could be relevant given the weekend that's just gone. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I'm a very big Melbourne supporter. Bad luck on the weekend, but it had been coming the last couple of weeks, I think. Um, just about with um, Petrarca being ill, who makes that decision in the morning um, to play for him to play? Because yep. he, I just he just lacked so much energy and um, yeah. Yeah, look, it's a really good question. You know, before the you know, obviously in the morning, you know, Christian was uh, a little bit crook, and you know, discussions with the doctor, with Christian, with myself. Um, you know, you always rely on the athlete to, to make that ultimate decision around, you know, is he fit to play? And, and Christian was prepared to put his hand up. And you like to use these opportunities as, you know, not only in the short term, but also long term. If this was a big final and a big game or grand final day, whatever it might be down the track, um, if you put your hand up in this situation, are you going to be able to perform? And you know, the information we got on the weekend that his energy was so low that he, he just didn't have the ability to perform to the level. So you get a little bit more information about, you know, from a club perspective, from an athlete perspective, and you can make better decisions moving forward. Robbo's on the road. Go, Robbo. Yeah, g'day, guys. Just a quick one for Goody. Who's, in your opinion, is the closest to Melbourne at the moment in terms of line for the flag this year? Oh, that's a really tough question. You know, teams are continuing to evolve. You know, you, you saw Collingwood yesterday. They, they took another step forward in their progression. Carlton have obviously got some enormous strengths and have progressed their games in all phases of the game. Brisbane, Fremantle um, have got an enormously talented playing list, but also a great system in behind the way they play. Um, and ultimately what it comes down to is your game going to stand up in the in finals footy. And, um, and are you going to be able to play the best footy you can at, that, at the right time of the year? And that's what we're all striving for. The biggest question, of course, that come out of the weekend, and I, w I would imagine one of the greatest challenges for you and probably the whole coaching group is what, how did you get around Jake Bowie and just explain <laughs> to him that, look, this is life. He got to cop one of these every now and then. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how he comes into the club today. <laughs> I think it's once you experience losing, it's always how you react to losing and how you respond to it. Well, he's, uh, and what would you expect from him, from a young fellow like him, the way he goes about it? Uh, he, he's a, he's a highly competitive kid, yeah. so he'll be, he'll be dirty and he'll come in and have an enormous week of training. There's no doubt about that. Hey, uh, yeah, good. it's so good of you to come in. We would have an open invitation to every coach in the competition to do what you've done this morning. We really appreciate it. And Melbourne supporters do. And I think 98% of the audience do. Melissa still can't get over the fact that you've been here to, talked about Melbourne for half an hour. But and the fact that this is, that loss has been coming for a couple of weeks. 65,000 <laughs> members is the target. You're just over 60,000 and there's an opportunity for Melbourne supporters to still get involved. Yeah, there is. You know, we've got uh, five game memberships at $65 and we'd love to get to 65,000. You know, I don't think anyone in Melbourne thought that was possible a few years ago and to create the 65,000 in the next few weeks would be enormous. The oldest football club in the world, or certainly from an Australian point of view, and only four men have coached them to a premiership, and this man is one of them. So um, a legend of the footy club already. Good on you, Goody. Thanks for coming in. We do appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Lucky guys. Thanks right. for having me.